Howdy. Well, just about the time I think that I might be able to, you know, get by with just a couple of videos, all kinds of current events start happening. And of course, we had two policemen shot at Ferguson. We had, uh, what, the police chief and what, was there a judge also that had to resign there? It was, uh, the cover story was uh, something to do with saying the N-word on Twitter. But the behind the scenes story was that the cops were illegally uh, using their the power of their station for revenue collection, and that's against their state laws, not not only against uh, any sort of ethics you ever heard of. So, um, well, but remember, just as I signed off last show, I told you about the Niels Herrett court case. He was uh, defamed in writing, uh, called a conspiracy crackpot. Uh, might as well be talking to a Holocaust denier. Now that's the type of thing that is a, a severe insult to a professional scientist. I mean, you just don't call a scientist a crackpot. And in, in, uh, under Danish law, apparently uh, the only defense that they have, is they could call for the right of freedom of speech, free speech. But that can only be used if what they're saying is true. They have a, a really strong laws against just saying nasty things about each other. <clears throat> so uh, on the 12th, he got to present his evidence. He actually got to show for the first time World Trade Center dust with the thermite residue in it was presented as evidence in a court of law and uh, also got to show uh, several videos and he claims that the, uh, the tribunal, is a, I think it was three judges, and they hadn't ever seen anything about Building 7. They were amazed. So anyway, we're going to play this, and it's about a 10-minute clip. Uh, it's kind of hard to hear the audio a little bit. There's a lot of background conversations, but uh, it's worth listening to anyway. Well, we'll be back in about 10 minutes. So Nils, uh, we just went to High Court, it's less than uh, one hour ago, it's the uh, 12th of uh, March 2015. And how did you think, the, the, how do you feel that the court case went? Overall, I'm very pleased. Uh, and of course, there was also disappointment on our way. But our overall aim actually was a success in this sense that we uh, got the opportunity for once to present a video of World Trade Center 7 collapsing in court three times actually first over the introduction to the place and at that time I recognized a state of astonishment uh, among the three judges Suddenly, we got their attention very obviously, and uh, I understand that, as usual, <laughs> none of them had heard about or seen the collapse of Building 7 before. And actually, that was my main achievement. And this already happened within 10 minutes. And during the morning, I also presented the architects and engineers 9-11 truth petition. It has been now read in court, in a courtroom. The 9-11 truth petition now is a judicial document in a Danish court. It has been submitted to the court. It was read in the courtroom. Uh, the 2,300 and how many? 43 now signatories of the architect and engineers 9-11 truth petition uh, were mentioned, not everyone by name, uh, and also the more than 20,000 supporters. Uh, we got the opportunity to read, actually, the uh, the footnote in the NIST report uh, on the Twin Towers. This is a footnote which I hold in very high esteem 
I love it. Maybe you should mention it. Yeah, I'll tell you what it is. It is if you, whoever interested, if you go into the NIST report on the Twin Towers, to page number 82, and at the bottom you will find the footnote number 13, in which the NIST investigators, in a kind of cryptic language, they admit that the 9-11 report on the Twin Towers does not cover the collapse. This is, in my opinion, the most important footnote since Second World War, because it, it means that there is no technical account of the collapses of the Twin Towers. This was read in court as well, both in English and in Danish translation, and even one of the judges asked me to repeat the last sentence because she didn't get the point, which is very hard to get, because the language applied in this footnote I would call academic terror. It's, 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 it's phrased in such a way that you have to be trained and read it more than twice in order to get the point. But they got the point. So they understood that the official, and this was perfectly clear, they understood that the official account for the collapse of the World Trade Center is false. This was the main aim of today's court case. And the second, the second, you may say, aim, of course, is to win the case. And I made my point during what we call the procedure, it probably not the, the final statement. Each part get, we, it took me half an hour to go through all the arguments in a legal sense why we should win the case. And we should win the case according to law because according to Danish law, the criminal code, you are not allowed to call me by name, a crackpot, and put me together with Holocaust deniers and creationists. And this is a downright insult to science. No doubt about that. The, the point in question here is if, if the journalist is protected by the freedom of speech, <coughs> excuse me, according to the European uh, Human Rights Commission. Code, uh, Article 10, which protects the, the, the freedom of speech, Section 1. But Section 2 of Article 10 also gives the countries the right to apply, uh, what do you say, laws to regulate society, among other things, to prevent people from downright insulting each other. So within, in, in the, uh, the European Human Rights Convention, embedded in that is the protection of individuals against defamation and libel in order to register, of course, if you have total freedom of speech, it would mean that everybody could say anything about everyone, and it, it, it would not serve democracy under these circumstances, because, because uh, the exchange of ideas would deteriorate, it would not be possible to have a sound discussion under these circumstances. So this is why we have the Criminal Code in Denmark, and it is within the European Human Rights Convention that, that you should also have guidelines for how the discussion, how the freedom of speech is applied. So, and, and this comes into, this is what is happening here. So there is no doubt that it is what I've been, what you say, the, the target for in terms of libel and defamation. There's no doubt that it is a violation of the Danish Criminal Court and what I told in court, there's no doubt that the journalist is not protected by the Human, human Rights Convention and freedom of speech. 
and he should be sentenced. And he's not protected because you don't have a factual basis? Yeah, that's one thing. That's one of the conditions you have to fulfill if, you're, if your defamation should be allowed for. You should have a factual basis for what you said. It has to be true. But they have absolutely zero factual basing, basis for putting me in the same league as Holocaust deniers and creationists. They have none. And I think we came very well across for the court uh, on this point. I th I, uh, overall, I, I think we, <laughs> we came across very well, but libel suits can go either way. History says that it's unpredictable how the judges will vote. And my, um, my um, legal advisor tells me that it boils down to the very simple question among the judges, and that is, is this reasonable? So I try to project myself as a reasonable scientist, and actually I end my presentation in my last words by the question, is this reasonable? And then pointing to the court case of Galileo Galilei, who oh, we all know was taken in, in front of the Inquisition in 1633, and by force, he had to withdraw the statement that the Earth was circulating around the Sun. And his book was on the Catholic Church list of forbidden books until 1838. So I made that comparison without, of course, uh, pretending that I by no means has the right to polish the shoes of Galileo Galilei. I'm just an ordinary, very ordinary, retired scientist from the University of Copenhagen who just can't stand the, the fundamental laws of Galileo and Sir Isaac Newton are not respected in the public domain. And yes, you did a fantastic job. Okay, well, uh, we're back, and what part of corporate personhood are you confused about? This is a, a thing that Dr. Don had, and he left it behind once, so I grabbed it. It says, slavery is the legal fiction that a person is property. Corporate personhood is the legal fiction that property is a person. Okay. Well, moving right along, uh, how about the Julian Assange case? He's been in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for fear of uh, being extradited to the United States where he might be tried for his life for treason. Uh, and the kind of sham uh, pretense that the, they'd use to get him is the uh, so-called uh, rape charges from Sweden. Well, for a long time, Sweden has been criticized. Why don't you go to London and question him there instead of letting it be a big international incident? And uh, I guess they finally relented and they, they planned to go to London. So here's a, a, a short story about that from Russia Today. Swedish prosecutors have offered now to question Julian Assange in London, where he's currently holed up at the Ecuadorian embassy. The whistleblower is wanted in Sweden on sex assault charges, which he continues to deny. Let's go live to London. And uh, our correspondent Daniel Hawkins is there. Uh, Daniel, as far as Sweden is concerned, this is a pretty big U-turn then. Initially they said they only wanted him in Sweden. Now it looks like they're set to come to London, yeah? Well, absolutely, Kevin. A real U-turn here by the Swedish authorities, really coming as a surprise to those involved. Assange has been detained since 2010 uh, because of those allegations of sex charges against him in Sweden. He's maintained his innocence and also maintained a willingness to fully cooperate 
with Swedish authorities. To get this matter resolved, he said he's happy to be questioned via video link or even directly here at the embassy. But the prosecutors have until now demanded that he be extradited to Sweden. Uh, as you say, they have now changed their mind and are happy to conduct that investigation here in the embassy and conduct uh, even DNA testing as part of that procedure. Why the change of heart? Well, really, it's because of legal reasons. The statute of limitations in Assange's case expires this August in just a few months, meaning if he's not questioned soon, uh, any potential charges against him will have to be dropped. Really, this is a last-ditch attempt for the prosecutor to conduct that investigation. Well, Assange's uh, legal team have already welcomed this news uh, and pending Assange's consent to being questioned, they said they will seek legal assistance from the British authorities to set this process moving. Of course, the British authorities will have to be involved because Assange is effectively uh, a legal prisoner on UK soil. Assange has been holed up here in the Ecuador embassy behind me since June 2012. This coming Monday will mark 1,000 days since he's been inside that embassy. He's not allowed to leave because if he does, he'll be arrested immediately by the police officer standing guard outside 24-7. He sought refuge uh, in the embassy uh, those years ago to avoid extradition to Sweden, but it's not that which he really fears. His concern is that his case is politically motivated and that he will be uh, sent to the United States to face charges uh, because of his leaking of diplomatic and other government material on the website WikiLeaks. That could, of course, land him uh, with potentially a life sentence or even the death penalty. So that's his real concern. So really, uh, the, the legal team and Assange, his supporters, are hopeful of a step forward here in uh, this legal wrangling, which has been going on now for almost half a decade. Kevin. Mm. Daniel, thanks for the update there. Well, as you're saying, he's been there a long time, hold up, but it's come at a big cost as well. Keeping an eye on Assange while he's been locked up there at the Ecuadorian embassy has been uh, costing British taxpayers a very hefty sum. According to some estimates, indeed, the Metropolitan Police have blown more than £10 million to watch the whistleblower. If you work that out, it works out to an average of around £14,000 every day. Well, it's a big story maybe brewing here. We'll continue to follow it. You know we have before. We're still on the case with it. We'll bring you more details as soon as we get them. Okay, now, um, a problem that we're having in community after community in, you know, Ferguson, any, any place that has a concentration of black people, is, there's a great example that right there because they're incarcerated at a much higher rate than, than white people. That's the white privilege. You know, white guys can go around yelling at cops and stuff and nothing happens. Black guy goes around yelling at cops. If he doesn't get shot dead, well, he'll probably just get rousted and busted and put in jail for a couple hours, maybe 72 hours, maybe forever. Well, anyway, what are the alternatives to incarceration? Do we have to have privatized jails? I think that's immoral. I think it's the height. I don't understand how any society could ever entertain the idea of privatizing jails, making a for-profit motive to put people in jail? That's obscene. Well, let's take a look at this. This is from Brave New Films, the Michael Chusadowski website. Just another in a recent spike in homeless arrests. 20% arrested this month have been homeless. You get arrested just because you're homeless. The typical long-term chronic homeless person was being put in jail a lot because of small petty crimes, open containers, trespassing, loitering, all those kinds of things. Columbia, South Carolina, another city criminalizing homelessness. Well, where are the homeless people supposed to go? The homeless end up in the criminal justice system because there hasn't been a better alternative. I served three and a half years at the Utah State Prison, so I've been homeless a little over a year now. This morning, I had got out of jail, sat down like this, the officer had pulled up on his motorcycle and told me I was going to jail. This was the same officer who had just taken me to jail not even 24 hours ago. Our homeless need long-term treatment solutions instead of just incarcerations and then put them, put them back in the street. Just because I don't have a car, I don't have a credit card in my pocket or change in my pocket or a home to go to, does not make me a criminal. 
We did a survey here, it was about $20,000 per person per year on the street because of emergency services costs. Jail time, EMT runs, emergency room visits. And so we realized we were incurring those costs anyway. There's a much more humane and economic way in order to meet their needs. You'd be surprised who's homeless. Most people are homeless. They are running away from problems. They are running away from you know, drug addiction. Got molested when I was a kid, about six years old. Started drinking early age of 13. I couldn't deal with my problems. I've been homeless for the last 20 years. About 10% of the homeless population were chronically homeless. A chronic homeless individual that's been homeless a year or more or four times in three years. A lot of mental health issues, substance abuse issues. We decided to adopt a housing first model. Instead of asking people to change their lives before we gave them housing, we chose to give them housing along with the supportive services and then allow them to change their lives if they wanted to. We can house them for about $7,800 per person per year for case management and rental assistance in a housing unit. 2005, in order to get into housing, you need to be clean, dry, and sober. And if you fell off the wagon, then you lost your housing and case management. Well, we weren't reducing homelessness. In 1998, we got kicked out because I was using drugs. We went back again. It's like a routine for the last 15 years. I mean, it was hard. Having a house is the stable base for everything. If you don't have a stable place to live, that's going to be the biggest crisis on your mind every day when you go to bed. Whereas when you're in your own home, that whole level of stress is taken away. And now you can focus on everything else that you need to focus on in your life. But it works because we've come down 72% from our high in 2005. Getting my housing here literally saved my life. Well, they arrested me at least 18 times. I ended up at the detox. The police brought me in there. I was pretty sad, I was shaking hard. But Ed moved me in here. I mean, I had towels up there, clean sheets, pots and pans. He brought me a big box full of canned goods. He said, well, anything you need, call me. And I looked around and I told him, I said, no, Ed, I got it from here. We've been able to show that if you house people properly and correctly, is that it takes them out of the judicial system and the recidivism rate decreases. It's kind of like a security place for me. I know I got a place to stay. This is good, good feeling. If I was still the homeless guy, I would have continued on and drank myself to death at this point. It's my first complete 100% sober year. And it's a good start, I feel, you know, not the end of my program, but it's a good start. The ultimate goal is to eliminate chronic homelessness here in Utah by the year 2015. And the results here prove that that is an achievable goal. The old approach of emergency shelters and transitional housing has been a failure. Housing First has been accepted nationally. This is the key to ending chronic homelessness. The Casper Housing Authority is trying out a system they first saw in Salt Lake City. Staff say they've already seen success stories. Now with the Housing First, we're much more successful in getting them housed and out of the criminal justice system and off the street and help them integrate back into society. We're actually moving out today. It means a lot to me to have my family back where we can be by ourselves and it does help you. If you do need to come here, everyone needs a helping hand here and there. It is most cost effective. We can serve more people with the same amount of dollars than if we didn't do this program. But it's also the right thing to do. It just makes sense. I got arrested about 34 times due to drugs. Over and over again. Over and over and over again. I was arrested 14 times for being under the influence of a narcotic. And no one say, this is his 14th time through here, Your Honor, for the same charge. He needs help. What if we tried something different? I've been arrested so many different times. 
had a couple of possession charges. I've had a couple of prostitution charges. I've had a ton of probation violations. I really can't even remember what the first thing I got arrested for. Urban drug addiction has been with us for as long as we've had cities. And so many major social problems come to the criminal justice system to be fixed because there isn't something else out there. But don't ask the criminal justice system to do it all because the only thing we really know how to do is send people to prison. So eventually I started living in a tent and this is kind of my old home. This is what it looks like back here. It was an endless cycle. It was between tent and jail for like seven years. I've probably been booked in and out of King County Jail like 50 times. It hurt to lay down, it hurt to stand up. It was really excruciating. I came to Seattle, I wanted to buy a large amount of Oxycontins. They weren't readily available and everybody kept offering me heroin. I turned it down for four days. Finally, I was so sick. I was puking, I had diarrhea, I was shaking. I felt like I was gonna die. So finally I caved in and I did heroin. My addiction got out of hand and three or four days turned into like nine years. Belton kind of runs between First Avenue and Fourth Avenue almost every other night on the news. There were just like constant arrests happening. It goes on in the open for everyone to see. Two days ago we saw probably 40 dealers. Drug addiction in Belltown is rampant. Police published this photo to show how many they collected in just one week. A few times I honestly tried to just kick on my own, but I got so sick. I was to the point where it was either I have to be on methadone and quit, or I'm gonna die. I asked to speak to the sergeant. I told him nobody's ever given me a chance before. So I'm sitting in this cell and I'm already getting sick. And he comes back and he tells me, for your own good, I hope that you make it to that methadone appointment. There's one thing you have to do for me first, is you have to talk to these people from this new program called the LEAD program, and then you're free. You can leave. I'd never been given a chance before. Uh, the approach that we had over the last 35 years or so of just arresting and putting people in prison for having serious addictions, well, we all know intellectually that's not the answer. When we finally sat down and said, well, what we really want to do is have another option for the officer on the street, something other than taking them up to jail. What if you, instead you could take them right to a treatment program? One reason it works is it costs the taxpayers a lot more money for them to be on the streets. It costs a lot more money for police, it costs a lot more money for hospital visits. In the end, it's the humane, financial, smart thing to do. And that's what the LEAD program does. It provides both the relief to the neighborhood, the police will come and respond to open air drug dealing, but it also can provide relief and hope to people who have had long-term addiction. Long-term addiction literally changes the chemical makeup of your brain and makes it impossible for you to be anything but an addict. I had everything that I would possibly want. A beautiful wife, two great kids. At one time I was making up to $185,000 a year. I just loved, I love heroin. I love that feeling. The good times don't last. I've seen tons and tons of people get arrested for it. And I've been stopped and caught with drugs on me a number of times. Personally, I've seen five people overdose and die. I know about 15. The last partner I worked with <laughs> overdosed and died in front of me. It was almost like this is my last chance. I can either wake up the next morning and go into treatment or I can come back here. Officer Willoughby, he actually said, have I had enough? So I answered in the affirmative. He was like, well, let's see what we can do. Drug use and abuse should primarily be treated as a public health issue. 
LEAD is a harm reduction program, and if they do choose to be in the LEAD program, they will receive individualized case services, whether it be substance abuse treatment or housing or job training, with an understanding that breaking addiction, which can you know, last for decades, is not going to be an overnight process. So it's really about meeting the client where they are at and trying to help with their basic needs first and then trying to work on substance abuse treatment. It wasn't government telling this person, this is what you need. It was the person who had been struggling with addiction saying, this is what I need to get back on my feet. And through the skillful help of the case managers, we're able to customize a way out for so many people. Most of the services in this city, you get like one shot. They give you all these services, they try to help you, and you test dirty, you're fucked. They, they, will, they will drop you. You know, I've relapsed, so I didn't call them or even go to the lead office for like two weeks. And when I walked in, my caseworker was like, where have you been? And I remember this very clearly. He said, so what, 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 what's next? What do we do next? I think I actually cried. For the first time in over like five years, did not feel like somebody had given up on me. I've been working with Brad just about a year now. And so wherever he's at, um, I'll be there. And I always tell my clients that, like, whether you're doing great, whether you're not doing great, uh, we're going to continue to work together. What makes us different is that, you know, we have a relationship with them. You know, actually hear their story, because a lot of our clients, you know, people don't really care about their story. And so um, respecting them and giving them dignity um, increases the likelihood of change. We can use the power of the law, and not as a blunt instrument, but as a way to nudge people toward an outcome that is better for them, that's better for the community. My life now is amazing. I have been clean for like a year and a half. I'm going to college. I wake up in a house. It's not a tent anymore. 61 days ago, I was homeless, a full on in my addiction. And today, I go to meetings, I'm clean, I've been through a treatment program. And none of that would have happened without me. A couple of our detectives that have been working the Belltown area for a long time, they were just saying how now it is like 90% different as far as like very few people out compared to what it was two, three, four years ago before LEAD. The LEAD program is now expanding from Belltown throughout the downtown core and into Chinatown. We have a lot of people in need. So we have the resources now to go out and individually work with them. It's also been operating in Skyway and has now been replicated in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Do you want the same old, same old, with the same results, <laughs> or do you want something that works? It's working here in Seattle. I think it could work anywhere. We're happy to be the example that shows that harm reduction, working hand in hand with law enforcement, can take us into uh, a new approach to drug crimes. And, and I think our nation you know, desperately needs that. one of several police shootings involving people with mental illness. 18-year-old Keith Bidell struggled with schizophrenia. He wasn't violent. And all they wanted was help getting him to treatment. Seconds later, the officer shot and killed him. They murdered our son for no reason. Another disturbing video that raises questions about the treatment of the mentally ill behind bars. He would hear voices. The extraction team restrained him. Minutes later, the 33-year-old was dead. Jails are the number one mental health facilities across the country. They house more mentally ill person versus any hospital, any psych facilities, any anything. They're patients, not prisoners. Mental illness is the only disease that when you're in a crisis, the cops are called. If you're having a heart attack, you don't call the police. People with mental illness are being criminalized instead of being provided treatment. These kind of jails and law enforcement, that's a public safety net. That's where you end up. There has to be some sort of solution, some sort of help for people who are suffering from mental illness and become involved with the police. Jeff was the youngest of our four. He was finally diagnosed a paranoid schizophrenic when he was totally out of control and very frightening. I would have to call the police on him. They didn't know what to do. I would get calls all the time when I was on patrol for a person who was in a mental health crisis. 
I had no clue how to handle it. And I would just keep getting the repeat calls every couple days or every week to the same house, the same person. And I just accepted it that, well, oh, this person's just gonna be a repeat caller. We decided very early on that we needed to address folks that were nonviolent misdemeanor offenders that were truly being put in jail because of their illness. We knew that it was law enforcement that were first responders and that they would be the ones that would be in contact with individuals in crisis. So we decided what we would do first is train law enforcement officers in 40-hour crisis intervention training. So they're trying to recognize mental illness. When they come up on somebody that's got kind of strange behavior, they're not using their command voice and the command presence like they're taught in the academy. They realize right away that this person has a problem. We brought together a bunch of law enforcement officers from the sheriff and the San Antonio Police Department, and every one of them didn't want to be there. I heard things like, I'm a cop, I'm not a social worker, I don't believe in these hug -a thug programs, and this is a bunch of BS. Before I went through the 40-hour CIT training myself, I didn't have the resources on how to handle a mental illness. Well now, it's way different. You know, I have confidence that when I go into someone's home, if they are experiencing some type of, you know, mental health crisis, that I can get them to the right facility, and then I may never hear from them again. I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, I'm a voter, I'm a volunteer, I'm all these people. I contribute to my community and I have a mental illness. My diagnosis is major depression with psychotic features, dissociative identity disorder, and panic disorders. I've done the presentations to CIT training. I tell them, I want to be treated the way you want your mother to be treated if she was ever diagnosed with a mental illness. If I'm in a crisis, you know, I'm having a crisis and I don't, I, I don't understand what's going on around me. In incidents with people who have mental health issues, it's unfortunate to see the ones that result in the use of deadly force where an officer didn't have CIT training and possibly armed with that kind of information, that kind of training, outcomes may have been different. I never knew each morning when I got up what I might find. He began to talk about a fire in the garage. So I thought, would he, without knowing what he's doing, start a fire? How much danger is he in and how much danger am I in? So I called the police and I said, I'm terribly frightened. When they arrived, I introduced them to Jeff. And in this case, they came in plain clothing. They weren't in police uniforms. Now they could have handcuffed him, I guess, and pulled him out, but they are taught how different that person is that they're dealing with. So they began to talk to Jeff. If they can get the person that's ill to, in their own mind, they're cooperating, it's far less violent, it's better for the patient, and certainly it's better for our police. When nonviolent people go to jail with mental illness, they say three or four times longer than a violent offender, but when they get released, if they're not hooked up into treatment, they're gonna be right back in. There are so many people in their emergency rooms who shouldn't be there. The previous police chief here has actually kept data on how long his officers are spending in emergency rooms waiting for psych evals and medical clearance, eight to 14 hours. He spent $600,000 a year in overtime. Now here at the Restoration Center, the law enforcement officers are in and out within 15 minutes. What we have here at the Restoration Center is services patients who are in crisis. It's either walk in or brought in here by a CIT. They recognize the patients in crisis. They're not truly suicidal. They don't really want to hurt somebody. They just need help. There are about 18,000 people a year who are brought mainly by law enforcement officers to this Restoration Center who used to go to jail or emergency rooms or put back on the street. If you're a taxpayer and really don't know a lot about mental illness, the fact that the public's a lot safer when these people get treated and the taxpayer saves a ton of money. Over the last uh, five years, we've saved about $50 million in taxpayers' dollars. 
But we want everyone trained because of the potential daily that someone's going to come across someone who's in crisis. It's not a matter of if, uh, it's a matter of how soon. We've been coming up on six years uh, of existence and we don't have a use of force on our, on our unit, which means we've never tased anybody, uh, we've never shot anybody, we've never hit anybody with an asp, but patients, talking to them, we get the result we want in the end and we don't have to force it on them. You want CIT to respond because you're going to get the help that you need rather than be sent to jail. The issues that police officers have with people who have mental illness is not unique to San Antonio. That's all over the country, all over the world. So any city that would decide to focus on this, put an emphasis on this, would certainly benefit from it. I no longer thought, what if they have to shoot Jeff? We save money, we improve public safety, and uh, people can get functional again. I mean, why wouldn't you do this? It's really a, a no-brainer. Well, I don't say that you have to be afraid of the police, although that's a natural reaction, knowing what we know about things that happen at the hands of the police. But, um, you, you know, you'll run into good police and you'll run into bad police. So the thing that you have to keep in mind is be very, very careful. And don't, you know, let's just put it this way. Whatever the policeman tells you, do it. It doesn't matter if he's right or wrong. Do it. You are not a lawyer. You are not in a court. The policeman is not a judge. So arguing a case in front of this policeman is fruitless. Don't even try. Just do what he says. And when he does something wrong, make sure that you remember everything you can. Write it down if you have a chance. But the bottom line is, let him do anything that he wants to do. You're going to survive a lot more likely that way. Um, that's poor English, but anyway, you get the idea. So now I, I want to know, you know, are you still voting for a Democrat or a Republican when you go to the polls? Are you incredibly stupid? I mean, you still hear people debating whether they should vote for this Republican or that Democrat, or how about between two Democrats, which one should they have run? Which one of the two Republicans or whatever? You're really stupid if you think that there's a choice there. You are really incredibly stupid. I mean, haven't you lived through this enough? Over and over and over again, you vote for the incoming savior. You know, the Democrats are going to save us from the Bush administration. Oh, now the Republicans are going to save us from the Obama administration. The fact of the matter is that they're both complicit in all of those bills that we hate so much, like the Patriot Act and the uh, authorization for the usage of military force. And, you know, on that, you could just spend all day naming those things. There is no difference between those two parties. Now, Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush are likely to be your choice for president. Don't vote for either one of them or you're stupid. I mean, the, the idea is, oh, this, it would be really bad if, if person X got in, so I better vote for person Y because person Y is only three times as evil as evil can be, and this person is four times, so I'm going to vote for the three times evil. It's still three times evil. It's still evil. So stop voting for evil. Vote for somebody else. It's going to send a message when the Democrats and Republicans no longer have the power. Don't let them have the power. Anyway, if you don't understand that Hillary is probably one of the most evil corrupt persons in the entire world responsible for deaths, lots and lots and lots of deaths. She's the one that, uh, well, as head of state, she did a whole bunch of war crimes. 
just like Obama. They won't be able to go to any other country. They'll be arrested and tried for their crimes. That's Obama can't go anywhere else. Neither can Henry Kissinger. Well, let's play this thing and you'll see a little bit about how bad Hillary Clinton is and then we'll go on to something else afterwards. <laughs> Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight here in the InfoWars news studio in Austin. We're going to go to John Bounds' report. If you go to our website, you'll see a graphic up there with a quote from Hillary Clinton. We are losing, it says, and there's a picture of Hillary Clinton with a photoshopped Pinocchio nose. I'm sure if she had a real Pinocchio nose, she would say, oh, it's not a Pinocchio nose. I'm not lying. It's just I'm um, rehearsing for the role of Cyrano de Bergerac. But she is losing. She knows that they're losing, and one of the biggest losses yesterday happened as she's giving her long speech at the UN defending uh, her practices of having a private email server located in her, home, in her home because it was more convenient. Yeah, more convenient to escape scrutiny. Now, while she was talking about that, and she goes on to say, yeah, and you know, I get all these emails from Bill all the time. Just before that happened, just before she said it, the Wall Street Journal was talking to um, his spokesperson, and the spokesperson said this. The former president, Bill Clinton, who does regularly use Twitter, has sent a grand total of two emails during his entire life. Both of those as president, said his spokesman, Matt McKenna. After leaving office, Mr. Clinton established his own domain that staff use, he said. But Mr. Clinton still doesn't use email himself. It was very interesting. I saw that right away on Fox News when they were they came back after uh, broadcasting her speech, and the reporter who was on the beat said that pointed that out right away. And of course, Shepard Smith was in the studio, and he said, "Yeah, but you know, well, he's trying to defend Hillary Clinton." Shepard Smith was. He says, "Well, maybe Bill Clinton doesn't send any e emails, but maybe he was getting all these emails from Hillary Clinton. It's like baloney. You either use email or you don't use email. You don't need to try to defend the Clintons." But it just illustrates, as they always say, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. There you go. That's uh, Hillary Clinton. Let's go to John Bounds report on this. She's trying to flush her past down the uh, memory hole. Won't work. Here's John Bounds report. Hillary Rodham Clinton, mystery woman, first first lady to be under criminal investigation inundated by scandals from Little Rock, Arkansas to Washington, D.C. The Clintons squeaked by Kenneth Starr's lengthy investigation into what is now known as the Whitewater Scandal, a shady real estate deal the Clintons were never prosecuted for, although their associates were convicted of federal fraud and conspiracy charges. During the first year of Bill Clinton's tenure in the White House, they fired seven employees with the White House Travel Office in order to reward their friends with jobs. Travelgate erupted, and the Clinton's personal lawyer and deputy White House counsel, a man Hillary regularly abused, supposedly committed suicide over having to testify, knowing full well all of Hillary's devious secret pathways to power. Hillary lied under oath to the Office of Independent Counsel, claiming the last time she spoke with Foster was before Father's Day, when in fact Vince Foster's assistant had seen her with Foster four times after that date. Patrick Knowlton, an eyewitness, saw men in red vests fleeing the area before Foster's body was discovered. Fast forward to today. Hillary's private emails were all transmitted on a private server registered to her home in Chappaqua, New York, while she was acting as a Secretary of State that oversaw the overthrow of Gaddafi, the Syrian civil war, the turmoil in Egypt, and the Benghazi scandal. Ironically, President Obama signed a law last November that requires government officials to direct their official correspondence through private email to a government account. Earlier today, Hillary gave a speech about women's rights at the United Nations. Hillary addressed her globalist New World Order cohorts from a room in the United States where press freedom is heavily restricted. She then traipsed out to face the music yet again addressing her burgeoning career as a professional scandal creator by not initially addressing the subject at hand, instead acting presidential by speaking on the Iranian nuclear issue before launching into an orchestrated series of safe questions and even safer answers. So even if you have a work-related device 
with a work-related .gov account, you choose what goes on that. That is the way our system works. Earlier, so, her daughter Chelsea had announced that she might run for office, adding more loathing to the failed Clinton dynasty. We can expect Remember, Hillary the train wreck to announce Not that she is running for the highest death. executive position in the United to. States. Why in the hell would America vote for this entitled, disingenuous, double-dealing person for president? I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! If she survives this latest debacle, maybe her campaign slogan should be, Vote for Hillary. You think those were scandals? What difference at this point does it make? You ain't seen nothing yet. John Bound for Infowars.com. Okay, now, uh, you've heard about the New World Order, and you've heard about, you know, outside globalist interests trying to, you know, supersede our Constitution and things like that. What people don't understand is that every treaty that we sign supersedes the Constitution. It's the law. It's the Constitution that says that. It says treaties are the highest law of the land. So that's why the TPP is so terrible, because it winds up allowing, you know, you don't get to set your own ecological laws or your social laws or whatever you want. If they happen to conflict with somebody else around the world who's trying to do business, they can sue you. That corporation can sue your government. Okay, well, let's just play this. It's a short clip about the New World Order and the TPP. Go ahead. Malaysia's former Prime Minister, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, said that the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPPA, is a new world order strategy by a powerful pact of people led by the U.S. to dominate the world economy. Speaking at the international conference titled New World Order, Recipe for Peace or War, organized by the Perdana Global Peace Foundation, Dr. Mahathir said, globalization and borderless trade are being used to establish a one-world government. Referring to the free trade agreement as a regulated trade deal, he said countries that sign on the deal would be subjected to more rules and regulations than ever before. And of course, this is drafted by America. Obviously, it must favor America. And when we study it, we find that there are many, many things there which if we agree to, we'll be in trouble internally as well as externally. Internally, we cannot anymore design our own economic policy because every policy we make in the country must conform with this free trade agreement. For example, if we say, well, we want to give uh, this small, these contracts to local, it's not possible because you must be open. See, and as to exporting more to America, we are already exporting more to America, but uh, what, what do we have to export to America? On the other hand, American companies can come here and uh, compete in uh, getting contracts and all that, and uh, our people will not be able to go there and compete with them. Dr. Mahathir also pointed out that disputes arising from these trade deals mean corporations could sue sovereign states at investor arbitration tribunals in secrecy. Meanwhile, Dr. Thomas Barnett, who has worked in the U.S. National Security Services since the end of the Cold War, said that it's only normal that countries that sign on to international trade deals are subjected to some international treaties and business protocols that they must follow. He also says that trade partners with the U.S. have accrued many benefits and that the U.S. has gone out of its way over the last 40 years to encourage peaceful development. Barnett also pointed out that for the first time in Asian history, there is an increasingly prosperous and powerful China, India, South Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia and Japan. 
the more you want to globalize, the more you want to connect with the outside world, the more you're going to be subject to the laws of international treaties, international business practices. Uh, the country that's been sued the most times in the WTO is the United States. The country that has lost those suits the most has been the United States. So we put in motion a, a global judiciary function on trade that has benefited the rest of the world more than us. Brushing aside Barnett's argument, Dr. Mahate in his speech warned governments to be cautious, saying that those who refuse to conform are subjected to economic sanctions. He also said that the one world government wants to undermine all other governments and would not hesitate to invade and occupy sovereign states to achieve its agenda. Hands up, don't shoot. Well, that's not just a saying, and it's, you know, whether it fits certain situations exactly or not is irrelevant because the overlying issue is real. And this clip that we're going to play here kind of underlined uh, that whole problem. Here's a DEA agent who's blowing the whistle. He's telling that he was told not to bust white people, that he could bust blacks, but don't bust those white guys. Got oh, a no, job no working at the police station where I was summer youth employee working for a number five precinct. They throw me their keys and I would have to get in their cars and like they park up the block, I have to either back up or take it around the block. Either a kid sitting in a police car. Oh man, my chest just grew about 10 inches, man, you know, cause I get in the car and I'm riding. And I started thinking this is what I want to do. I became supervisor of group 42 for the Drug Enforcement Administration. They cross-designated me. I had to get sworn in as a special agent for DEA. So now I'm doing, I'm doing double dual tasks. I'm a U.S. Marshal and I'm a special agent for DEA. That's when I picked up the name Batman. I'm talking about Gotham City, man. We were rolling, man. We were jumping on guys in the middle of the night, all of that swooping down on folks all across the country. And using these sort of tactical operations that we went out on that you would use in Vietnam or using some type of war-torn zone. And all of the stuff that we were doing, just calling it the war on drugs. And it wasn't very many black guys in my position. So when I would go into the war room where we were setting up all of our drug and gun addiction task forces, determining what cities where we're going to hit, I would notice that most of the time was always appeared to be urban areas. And that's when I asked the question, well, don't they sell, sell drugs out Potomac and Springfield and, and places like that? Or maybe y'all think they don't. The statistics show they use more drugs out in those areas than anywhere. The special agent in charge, he says, you know, we go out there and start messing with those folks. They know judges, they know lawyers, they know politicians. You start locking their kids up, somebody's going to jerk our chain. He said, they're going to call us on it, and before you know it, they're going to shut us down, and there goes your overtime. What I began to see is that the drug war is totally about race. If we was locking up everybody, white and black, for doing the same drugs, they would have done the same thing they did with prohibition. They would have outlawed it. They would have said, let's stop this craziness because you're not putting my son in jail. My daughter's not going to jail. If it was an equal enforcement opportunity operation, we wouldn't be sitting here anyway. It's all about fairness, man, and understanding how would I want to be treated whether I'm on that one end or the other end, how would I want to be treated if everything was done equally? Okay, well, another show in the can there, and we'll be back again next Saturday. And I know it's supposed to be a live call-in show, and I haven't opened up the phone lines for about a year now. Anyway, I'll see you next Saturday, and have some fun.